This meeting is being recorded. This is the Portuguese Oral History Project for the California State University of Fresno through the Portuguese Beyond Borders Institute as we record oral history interviews for our archive, our archive in the Portuguese American Oral History Collection at the Fresno State Library and of course through our YouTube channel as well. And so welcome everyone to another one of our legacy projects, which is our Portuguese American family history through our oral history collection. And so we're going to start. What is your full birth name? My full birth name is Flumena Consula Song, and my maiden name is Pimentel, but my married name is Rocha. And so, uh, Filomena, were you named after anyone? And is there any particular story behind your name? So my dad's middle name is Flumenu. So I'm after his middle name. And then I believe Consula Song was his village's patron saint. Oh, wonderful. So data. And so uh, when and uh, where were you born? Um, I was born in 1978 in Tulare, California. So what early memories, Filomena, do you have as a child um, in the Portuguese-American community? And was uh, Portuguese your first language? Yes, Portuguese was my first language. Um, I went to school not knowing nothing of English. Um, everything was Portuguese at home. Um, I guess my earliest memories, childhood memories is my parents would always talk about things that they would do back in their old country in Tercida. So I remember with my parents, my grandparents, we would have matanzas, um, we would make our own anish, um, just the, you know, having our traditional foods like the alcatraz and bafanas and um, bacalao. And, and I remember going to the festas and bullfights. And uh, at one point, my uncles were um, in the suicide squad. And then my other uncle was one of like the pastors for the bulls. So those are all memories I've had growing up. And then um, I was involved in Dancers Carnaval. And um, so I have a lot of childhood memories. And I think a lot of it stems from my parents just constantly feeding me with, with stories of what they would do and how they would live back in Tercida. So who immigrated, uh, I believe both of your parents are immigrants, but so who immigrated from in your family, uh, your mom and dad, and what trajectories did they take? So my mom actually came first. They both came in 1977. Um, my mother arrived first with my, um, with my dad's parents because he had to finish his term in the army. And then he followed, and then they were married here in, in Tulare. Um, my mother's family, they immigrated to Toronto, Canada. So she was the only one here in California. And that was, um, I think my grandparents in Canada immigrated like in 1976. And so on your father's side, the whole family immigrated to this area? They, correct. They all immigrated before him because he needed to finish his term in his army, in the army. And so... Um... What did they tell you from, as you know, you as you said, you were raised very Portuguese with the stories and the foods and the traditions. What did your family, both your parents and even grandparents, tell you what was the main reason why they left the Azores? So part of it was, I guess, uh, part of it was so <laughs> no one would go to Angola at that time um, because it was still, there was still turmoil going on. So there was, there was that fear of having your sons because my grandmother only had five sons. Um, of having to go to war. And the other part was, you know, previous family had come already to California and speaking of, you know, the American dream and the good life and, and opportunities. And so they all came for that same, same reason, the American dream, owning a home, those kinds of things and having opportunities. Cause as you could probably imagine at that time on a small Island, uh, opportunity for growth in, in any, any field, was probably limited. So why did your uh, family, the one that's, that came here, of course, to Tulare County, why did they settle in this area? Dairies. Uh, they all we they all worked on the same dairy, which is the dairy I grew up on, Nunes Brothers out on Road 124. 
Um, and it was very, there was dairies in our valley and that's what brought them because they had their own Lavoda back in, in Tresada, uh, a small one. And, and so that was their life. That's what they knew. And so they came here for dairies and farming um, and versus going into, you know, big cities. Like my, on my mother's side, my family went to Canada to work factory and construction because um, that was more of what my uncles knew of how to do. What did your parents uh, tell you as far as, because obviously when you were born, they had been here already a few years, so they were a bit adjusted to America. What, would the, what did your parents tell you when you, as you were growing up, what it was like to adjust here to this country, both your mom and your dad? What kind of stories and what kind of uh, difficulties, uh, and even when you were a child, the difficulties that you may remember that they had? Yeah, I would remember them talking about stories about Utuntu Salazar and uh, how strict things were, even like to the point of like cigarettes and lighters and um, and how this is kind of oh different from that, more democracy, more democratic. Um, and it was difficult to adjust. I think it was more difficult for my mom because she was the only one here versus, you know, my dad had his whole family here and cousins and other uncles. And so I think it was easier, but the challenge was, you know, not knowing the language, not really knowing the land yet, like your area, except for Tulare, right? They, if any anything further than that was more of a challenge. Um, I think to this day, they still have so that, that homesickness feeling, because um, it's not truly the same. Yes, they've grown, they've had opportunities, um, they're doing well. I think it's still that home life, that um, very close knit community that they would have back in Shada. Um, and some of those traditions. But um, I think it's those first years of just adjusting and, and um, as time grows on, it's, it's so this is what it's like to be in America, like it's work, it's, it's, you know, almost like what we say is adulting, you know, there's working and there's, you know, life changes and, and, and trying to do the education, that was a whole other challenge, because there was no way for them to communicate with with teachers or schools. So we had to, a lot of times we depended on someone else for that translation for them. But over time they learned and were able to, to, to adjust and to communicate and those types of things. For your parents, although they, they came here already as adults, but young adults, um, how important was it for them that you and also your sisters uh, continue with the language, culture, and traditions? How important was it for them? I think it was very important. And to this day, we still try to, I mean, when we go to mom and dad's, it's only Portuguese is spoken. Um, and we're, we've all tried teaching our, our children uh, to speak Portuguese. Um, it's the only way we communicated with our grandparents. It It's, it's, um, how do I explain it? It's, it's almost like a comfort feeling. Um, it's home. It's, it's natural kind of. Um, but yeah, she, they did a phenomenal job of just keeping and always t telling us the stories that goes behind the traditions, you know, and telling us how they would, you know, with, for example, now Scott and is coming up and, oh, we would start on a Saturday and we wouldn't finish till Fat Tuesday and then we'd have to go work the love on, on the next day. You know, doesn't matter how drunk you are, you still got to go because your, your vul would let us know. And it's just hearing those stories and passing it along and now they're passing it on to their grandkids. And it just, it, it ties, it's like, it's like I'm a part of Tseda, but I'm not. Even though I wasn't born there, their stories and the way they just tell about it every day, it's something different. You feel very much connected. Even though I've not been there or born there, I feel connected because of the stories my parents gave us. So you were also raised on your paternal side and your dad's side with grandparents locally. Uh, as you said, they all worked in the same dairy how yes. uh, how important was that to to have a grandparents that had even a different um, experience than your parents did? Because uh, your parents, as, we, as you said, came in their, uh, they were young, you know, they were in their 20s or around 20, but your grandparents were much older already. And so right. how, how did you, do you have any stories from that adjustment? And what do you remember of your grandparents? Um, they were kind of like the matriarch and the patriarch of the family. Um, 
you know, everybody was work. Everybody worked. Um, I remember my grandmother in the kitchen cooking for everybody. I remember her trying to teach me stuff. Um, I have pictures of me on the chair over the stove, you know, trying to make poppage and those kinds of things. Um, I think it was more, I think it probably wasn't as much of a challenge because it came together as a whole. And so there was that support system, right? I think it would be different if they came alone and trying to do that versus coming as a whole group and, and supporting each other. And you yourself. So now you have a family and of course you have, uh, so your mom and dad now have grandkids um, mm-hmm. and, uh, from, from your family and your sister's families. What, uh, what cultural traditions have you and your husband maintained and, and um, why has this been important to maintain them? Um, my mother-in-law would probably tell you I'm more Portuguese than my husband. And when it comes to traditions and foods and doing these things, um, just in fact, my daughter and I were planning, hey, are we going to the dance tonight? Um, so I've always exposed them. I've always taken them to festage. I've explained to them like what it means with the Holy Ghost festage, what dance of Caraval means. And of course, my parents are always telling their stories. Um, I think it just keeps the, the traditions and the, and the stories alive. We have to pass those down. If we don't pass them down, and if we don't communicate those and share those, it kind of dies and it ends. So they're not going to know. And, and you know, if you talk to my daughter, she'll be like, I remember visa of all, you know, and then she'll tell you something that she remembers about visa of all. Um, and even like my sister, she's got a blended family. So my niece is Portuguese and Hispanic. So she's teaching both. And, you know, this is how the Hispanic culture does this. This is how Portuguese culture does this. And so we're, we're, and she's learning both. And so, um, I think it's just important to just share those stories um, and enjoying those moments. And, and that way it goes, passes along because you never know if, if they'll die, you know, I don't, it would be sad to see those stories just die and end, you know, it's, it's great to share those and continue and, and reliving those. And, and those just, it's, those are happy memories and happy thoughts. And it just, it, it would be sad to see those types of things just stop. Real quick, professionally, you've worked, of course, in um, in retail, um, and then you decided to make a switch into education. So, tell us a little bit about your your professional uh, career and why did you switch to education? And what what have you found there? Yes, so yeah, I worked 19 years in the retail um, in management, um, and I did make the switch to education. I've always had a pool for education either in teaching, uh, being a teacher or in that education realm, I'm still working towards that. Um, and, and to see things, I guess I could, you could say I'm one of those parents that I want to see growth in every student, whether it's a special needs student, whether it's a program and we have phenomenal programs in, in uh, the school district I work with, you know, supporting those kids and supporting, cause I believe that they are our future. So the more we support our students now um, and give them growth, they will become, you know, role model citizens as part of our community. Those are going to be our future community members as well as the future of the country. Um, so, yeah, that was why I chose to go into education. I've always been a parent volunteer in classrooms. I've always worked closely with, with teachers, you know, my children's teachers. So the teaching and education realm has always been something I've, I've wanted to do. And in the Portuguese American community, you mentioned that your parents, you know, got you involved and you were, you know, involved in Carnaval. So tell us a little bit about the different uh, organizations and volunteer work and things that you've done within the Portuguese American community. So I, uh, so I was in Dantes Carnaval in the early 90s. Um, and I've noticed it's changed quite a bit because I'm like, where's the Hatton? And that's not how we used to dance the Dantes Pandeir or where's the Dantes Chupiada? Give me a good Dantes Chupiada. Um, and then uh, Gliding Grants is the local soccer club, and I was the queen for that. Um, my sister was a queen for the um, the Philharmonica, the Tulare Philharmonica, the Portuguese Philharmonica. Um, like I said, we've always attended our festage. I was involved with Luso American, the youth program, um, and, and danced folklore through them. Um, and then I, I kind of like in that high school, college realm, kind of toned out, still attended things. But now as an adult, you know, um, 
you know, and my kids are in school supporting their activities in the Portuguese community, um, supporting like events like the what you know through Fresno State, trying to you know promote, um, you know, talking to people, even at work, just sharing your culture. I mean, you would be amazed how food connects people, you know, or in cultures. Um, and and I I'm, I would like I see a future of getting more involved. It's just at this time in my in my life. Uh, you know, I'm heavily involved with, you know, a school organization and uh, leading the union for the school district. So those things kind of consume my time. Um, I have been asked to sit on, on, you know, to assist like, you know, with the soccer club. Tony Fraga was like, hey, I want you to join our e-board. I'm like, at this time, Tony, I, I could see myself doing it. But at this time with with the other extracurricular activities that I do and with my son, uh, still it's his senior year, um, now wouldn't be the right time for me to do it. But I do see myself getting more involved in those organizations. And to what extent you believe, uh, Filomena, that being Portuguese American um, or an American of Portuguese background, as you said, um, because your parents are both immigrants, has shaped uh, the way you are and how you've moved through life, both you know, the professional and the personal. So what, how has been Portuguese American? How has it shaped your, your, your life in many ways? I think, I believe our hard work ethic has definitely shaped a lot in both personal and professional. I don't think I could say, I mean, there's hard workers, but I could probably say like Portuguese people are probably the hardest working. They are so determined. They want so much for their children. Um, they sacrifice themselves and seeing that sacrifice for my parents for us you know to attend you know moving on to college and and extracurricular activities you know because i do talk to others and they didn't have the opportunity for college or or sports or those types of things and so um those that molded how i was going to raise my kids and that molded how i was going to perform and work and you know be honest be on time you know, those kinds of things that they had instilled in them has been instilled in me. And so hard work ethic, you know, being honest, loyal, um, those types of uh, traits have t carried me far. Um, and so I think that's that's stuff that's been instilled from my parents. And uh, how do you see yourself, as you said, um, food can go a long way. Uh, so how do you see yourself in your professional life um, in American mainstream uh, in a school district uh, or though how do you see yourself connecting to others and sharing your culture with them how do you, how how do you do that so I'll so I'm, I'm the union president for our chapter and I could say it was very difficult at first because in the Hispanic and Portuguese culture women being of an uh, uh, authoritative, um, position isn't welcomed easily. So that took a lot of hard work on my part to earn trust. Um, so I've earned, I've obviously have earned their trust to be elected for a third term. So um, it took hard work to, to break that, that mold, that old mold of, you know, women in power kind of thing, women in authority. But um, we do, we do share, you know, and it's funny, we sit around, we're talking and they're like, Hey, uh, you know, my mom would just show us a chunk and we would behave. And I'm like, really? My grandma and my mom would show me a wooden spoon. Same concept, same thing, you know. And, and it's just those kinds of things that connect us without even knowing they connect us. Like just casual conversations, um, you know, with foods. I do, you know, if we do share foods or we have potlucks and a lot of them like, well, you know, and a lot of them do. And I'm glad that they're open and they feel comfortable coming to me like, hey, Minna, um, so why do we have this fresh centillary? What's it all about? I mean, we go for the food, but what's it really about? And to to share like what's well, based on it on the on a story of you know Queen Isabella and you know sharing that they're like, oh, it makes sense. So those kinds of things and that that they feel comfortable enough to ask me, that's what I I like that they feel enough comfortable to ask our questions like. About any, you know, bullfights or what's it like over in this, you know, what was it like for your parents on a small island, you know, those kinds of things. Um, 
And it's just, it's just really communicating, being open, open-minded, listening to their, their culture, other cultures, other, other stories and be like, Hey, we do the same thing. And not knowing that we've shared a lot of those similarities in the way we're raised um, in some of our foods, how did our foods cross paths kind of thing in our, in our traditions, very similar. And it's great to, to share those. Um, how do you doing kind of a uh, comparison and contrast between the Portuguese community that you were born and raised um, and the Portuguese community today that uh, where you're a, a mom uh, and who knows, maybe you know, not very far, not very far in the future, grandma as well. So how do you, how do you see the community from when you were a child and a teenager um, and the community today, a few decades to today? Any comparisons that you can make, contrasts, any differences? I, there's, there's opportunity for growth. Um, what I see is different is even people my age, they've stopped speaking the language at home or, or and they've stopped talking about how our parents lived, you know, with no electricity, no refrigerators, you know, things like that and not sharing it with their children. So it's kind of a skewed, um, a skewed story, right? Because everybody wants to start the story of when they arrived here in America and that's where their story starts or the story actually starts before that. Um, so I see that kind of a change, um, not wanting, not really using your language and not sharing that. Um, but at the same time, I see us as being very diverse. Um, and, and what I mean is, is we have, is that the younger generation has the opportunity to continue, um, sharing our culture and diversifying it. I mean, what I mean, I guess by diversifying is it's okay to, to let other cultures into our traditions, um, it's okay for them to share in what we do. It's, it, it doesn't, you don't have to be Portuguese to enjoy our culture. You could be of other cultures, enjoy what we do. And it's okay to do that. And I think it's, it's, we're in that middleness um, that I think that's where I see the difference. It's not this old, just Portuguese, Portuguese, Portuguese. I think now we're meshing in with other cultures. And to me, I, to me, it's exciting because you see growth and it gives growth and it, it, it opens up so that, you know, someone like my niece who is Hispanic and Portuguese can feel comfortable being in either culture, cultural event and not have to worry about, am I Portuguese enough? Am I Hispanic enough? And I think that's where I see the difference where growing up, it's, it was just Portuguese culture and all you saw was the Portuguese culture. And now when you, you go, it's, you see Portuguese, you see Hispanics, um, Indian. So you see more diversity. And so I kind of, that's where I see the biggest difference is it's growing. Do you think the community is open to that diversity? Do you see an openness in the community that, as you said, when you were growing up was very closed uh, and very, everything was, you know, only Portuguese people went to the Portuguese festers, you know, mm -hmm. 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Do you see that the community is ready for this openness that, that uh, is uh, the new America? It can be. I think we're still probably at the baby steps, um, but I think it can be. I think, I mean, even in talking to my parents, you know, at one time, maybe they were that old hardcore Portuguese, but I think somewhere down the line, they've broken that mold. And so, you know, when I, when they told them, Hey, they, I was elected for president and they're like, yeah, right on. Or I'm going to play sports. Yeah. You know, it's that whole mentality of, you know, they were questioned, like, you're going to let your daughters do this. He's like, what's wrong with that? You know, so somewhere down the line, that thought process has changed. And so I think somewhere down the line, it's happening. It's just happening slowly. And I think it's, it's going to be probably my generation, probably my sister's generation, that's going to open that up more to be a lot more open. We're getting there. We're getting there. And you're seeing it. And, and um, but I think it's going to take probably our generation, my generation, probably my sister's generation to really expand that openness. But I do see it happening. Have you been to the Azores? I have not. It is on my bucket list. 
I do watch a lot of YouTube. Um, I feel like I know it just like I said, from listening to my parents, they were able to go in 2017. Um, they went to my grandmother's house. My grandmother still has a house there. Um, I have an aunt that still lives there. My husband has an aunt that lives there. My dad has cousins that live there. We all communicate through Facebook. So it's like, you know, um, you know, and, and that's the thing. Like, I, like I'll like i be like, oh, yeah, my parents went and ate at the Canitha. And they're like, where's the Canitha? I'm like, oh, it's a, you know, and I haven't been there, but I can tell them a little bit about it just because I'm reliving it through their stories or, but I have not been. It is on my bucket list. Do you think your kids as well would enjoy this this uh, experience, you know, because they have been raised also very Portuguese. Uh, and that, that's what two part questions. First of all, how, have your kids been obviously not of the same generation as you are, but have your kids been raised Portuguese first and would they enjoy a, a, an experience to see the, uh, the, the so-called old country, the, the islands themselves? They have been raised Portuguese. Um, and I think they would, my daughter's talked about it many times. She wants to see more of the, um, the history part, like the architect and the, the badge and those kinds of things. And my son has many times said he wants to go see bullfights so he could laugh at people and watch the bull take over. That's his favorite part. Oh, and then he's like, and I want to eat that, that sandwich that Volvo makes me, which is a bafana. Um, but he loves watching the videos too. And he does ask questions. And I think we've all at one time, we were like, so mom and dad, why did you guys leave your island to come here again? You know, because... It looks beautiful. It's you, you're, you're, you have your home. Like, and again, it's, it comes back to, well, there was an opportunity at their time. This was the American dream. This is where the opportunities were. And that's why they came. So we understand that part. It's just sometimes we're like, Hmm, is there job openings <laughs> over in Shady that we could possibly go back to? But um, I think they would absolutely thoroughly enjoy it. And what does it mean to you to be Portuguese America? What does that mean? Oh, what's it mean to me? Um, it means there's this pride, I guess. I feel proud to be poor. I'm not afraid to tell people, oh, I'm Portuguese. Um, you know, I don't, I'm not afraid to share. Uh, you know, I share my, my um, experiences. Like, yes, I was an ES, I was an ESL student. I didn't go to school with English. I, it, by second grade is when I was probably fluent in English, those kinds of things. Um, there's a pride of like knowing the challenges that our parents and grandparents came through, went through for me to be where I am today, you know, successful, um, good job, you know, having a family, those kinds of things, knowing how I got here and the history of it. That's what brings me the pride. Um, and knowing our culture and loving our culture and, and just loving our people. Our people are just so, the Portuguese people are, they're just so warm and inviting and they just make you feel cozy. Like it, like a big hug from everybody's your tia, everybody's your cousin, everybody's your uncle, that kind of feeling. And it, it's just, it's just a comforting feeling and knowing that those people are the ones who are going to support you. Well, Flamina, thank you so much uh, for being part of the Portuguese American Oral History Project at Fresno State. And is there anything that, I didn't cover that you'd like to share. I just think this is something wonderful that you're doing uh, because I, it's, I would love to hear, I love listening to other people's stories and, and connecting on what, what were the same and what was different. And I think it's, it's beautiful that we're able to do this and connect with, with people from all over. And um, so I thank you for the opportunity.